um, ha- who thinks that some of those headlines were a little bit sci-fi-ish? Who thinks that some of that stuff's not going to happen? Yeah, that's a common reaction. Okay, so who am I? <clears throat> My name's Roger Lawrence. I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Who's heard of Hewlett Packard Enterprise? Really? Who's heard of Hewlett Packard? HP? Yep, who's got an HP printer? You've all got an HP laptop or a printer, right? Okay, that's the HP. Right, well, HP last year split into two companies, and the one company is called Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And that's the company that I work for, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And my role um, is as a chief technologist, and I talk to companies all around the world about innovation. And so I do a lot of this. I do a lot of standing up on stages. Sometimes it's in a boardroom. Sometimes it's on a stage like this. Um, Sometimes it's just in a workshop. I do, in my spare time, a little bit of that. Um, I do a lot of that, a lot of traveling. Last year, I did 210,000 kilometers in the year. My average speed was uh, 25 kilometers an hour over the year. Um, I do a fair amount of of that. And... um, and I also look like Einstein, apparently. I, get a, I have a bad hair day as well. OK, so that's enough about me, but this isn't about me, this is about you. So why do I um, hear 30 odd years, a little bit more than 30 years after finishing a high school like you're finishing, how can I get to do all of those things? How do I get to travel the world? How do I get to talk to the CIOs and CTOs of major banks and government agencies about technology and about what technology is doing and about how technology is changing the world. And it's because of this guy. So um, who's heard of Gordon Moore? Who's heard of Moore's Law? Yeah, a couple of hands. Um, All right, so Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel. And in fact, he's had more impact on your life than Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, Although Leo got his Academy Award yesterday, so well done, Leo. Finally, he got his award. And Moore's Law says this. It says that the number of transistors we can put on a CPU will double every 18 months. In other words, we will effectively double computer power or halve its cost pretty much every year. And that led to this. So that chip is an Intel Atom 850U, and it uh, switches at 2.6 gigahertz. Has everybody heard of gigahertz? That means if you think of a light switch, it switches on and off 2.6 billion times a second, and it's cheaper than that grain of rice, which means that it's going to be in everything. So let's talk a little bit about the technologies that are coming, and they've started right now, and what skills you're going to need to have a successful career. And by, by successful career, I don't mean work for a company, you get paid lots of money. I mean, have a career or even a portfolio of careers as you go through your life that will give you the the material success but also the relationship and the travel success that that you're looking for, right? So the Internet of Things. Who's heard of the Internet of Things? Yep, who's heard of the Internet? Okay, so we've all actually... um, My my kids talk to me and they say, it was really weird that you were in high school before the internet. It's like, yeah, I know. But we had electricity, right? And we had ATMs. So the internet of things is this. Instead of just having your computers uh, connected to the internet, everything will be connected to the internet. Your watch, your fitness tracker, your um, lights, the street lights, your car, your washing machine, um, the uh, power grid, Everything will be connected to the internet, and everything will have a voice. What kind of skills do you think we need to be able to make that world a reality? Shout it out. Coding? Yep, absolutely. What else? What other skills do you reckon we need to make the internet of things a real thing? Programming? Yeah, programming, coding? Absolutely. Creativity? is uh, leads to some skills, innovation, creativity, but what some, some practical skills. What else? Here's some that I've thought of. We need to be able to network things together, right? If you, if you can't network uh, your light bulb and your washing machine to the internet, well, they're not going to be on the internet, so we need to, to network them. Obviously, we need programmers, um, data scientists. Here's the thing, right? When you've got all of these sensors gathering information, 
and you've got all of these actuators going to do something. So, so let's say we've got sensors um, sensing traffic and weather and accidents and noise and congestion and pollution, and then we've got actuators actually turning on um, street lights and making car parking spaces available and billing people, right? Then you actually need to understand the data that you're getting from all of these sensors and how you use that data, right? Um, we need security specialists. Imagine the power of a botnet if everybody's light bulbs in every house, in every um, suburb in Sydney, let alone the world, was hacked and made into a botnet, right? Because you've got that Intel processor, you've got that little microcomputer controlling all the lights. If those get hacked, now suddenly you've got this massive botnet that you can use to brute force password hacks or to take down the air traffic control system or pretty much whatever you want to do. So we need to secure those networks. So we need security specialists. Ethicists, why do you reckon we need ethicists? Yeah, what sort of ethical issues? Right, so there's privacy, right? Um, you know, it's one thing people knowing where you live, it's another thing them knowing how much electricity you use or, um, you know, uh, when your lights are on and when you're at home and when you're not at home, right? So we've got privacy issues and we've got ethics that we've got to worry about. And then the smart home handyman, right? Here's the guy who can actually, um, and it's not just for smart homes, it's for all sorts of buildings, factories, office blocks. Right? Here's the guys who can actually practically wire things up and, and work with a bunch of different technologies. Okay, so that's the Internet of Things. Let's talk about wearable tech. Who's got a smartwatch? Okay, one or two people. Uh, Android or iOS? Android, yeah, okay, you're students, so I understand that. Um, <coughs> you can afford it, right? Um, <laughs> well, Apple is just very expensive. Um, okay, who's got fitness tracker? Yeah, whose parents have got fitness trackers? Yeah, there's the market, right? It's the middle-aged bulge that, that uh, everybody's getting into fitness, fitness trackers. So wearable tech's not just about fitness trackers. Wearable tech's also about clothing. So here's a wearable baby grow that will tell you, tell you when your baby's lying on its stomach, which it shouldn't do, when it needs a feed, when it's got a wet nappy or a dirty nappy, uh, what its pulse is, how its breathing is, right? You think data, uh, baby monitors were a cool technology. This is going to drive parents insane. Um, but it's not just that. I, I work with a company who invented a fan footy jersey. So you put on the jersey as a fan, and you feel what your favorite player on the footy field feels. So if he gets tackled, you get a thump in the side. If he's about to take a kick, you feel butterflies in your stomach, right? And wearable technology is going to to pervade everything that we do. Think of a soldier um, who's got all of his telemetry um, coming through his clothes. He doesn't need to put on a fitness tracker. He just puts on his jacket, and it's taking his pulse and his blood pressure and, um, and knows exactly where he is because of the GPS and gives him a heads-up display where all of his friends are. That world is here. It's already happening. So what sort of skills do you need there? Well, we actually need fashion designers because, believe it or not, old people don't want to wear a horrible, ugly fitness tracker or a fall tracker. They'd rather have a brooch that actually looks fashionable, right? And uh, a lot of the wearable technology at the moment is about fashion. Healthcare specialists. Uh, wearables are going to be massive in the hospital. Imagine, I mean, already I went to, to a doctor last week and she wanted to take my pulse and I said, no, 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 don't worry about taking my pulse. I've just come across um, Sydney traffic. I'm feeling stressed. I've been waiting in your waiting room for an hour. Um, one pulse reading is not going to give you any real information. Let me give you my Fitbit pulse rate for the last three months. And you can see what my resting pulse is, and you can see what my exercise pulse is, and you can see when I was sick and when I come, uh, wasn't sick. And healthcare specialists are absolutely going to be um, critical in driving wearable technology. Okay, UI, UX designer, physiotherapists, um, because we'll have wearable technology that will be exoskeletons that will actually do physio for you, right? And actually help you out there. Occupational therapists, neuroimplant technologists, that's the one that I like. This is where they take um, somebody who's an amputee and they give them prosthetic legs and they control the legs with their brains, right? They literally think and that gives the legs electrical impulses to walk. And um, do a Google. There's actually a surgeon right here in Sydney who's doing osteo-integration right now. 
It's a real thing. Okay. Virtual reality. Who's heard of virtual reality? Yep. Uh, where, where, where do you reckon virtual reality is going to play? What sort of industry? Yeah, gaming. You guys listened to the eSports um, um, speaker, didn't you? So, <clears throat> yes, of course, virtual reality is going to be big in gaming. It's going to be big in entertainment. Um, I reckon that we will have the first full-length virtual reality film within the next two years. It's definitely within the next three years, probably within the next two years. You'll literally have a full feature-length movie that's virtual reality. Now, think about that. Think about the implications of that. Because you're not just watching the, the actors that the director wants you to see, right? Because, the, you know, Kate Winslet and Leo Leonardo can be there, and you can actually turn around and go to the other place in the coffee shop and speak to and watch somebody else's interaction. So there's going to be a whole different way of making movies and experiences. Already at Davos, the, the World um, Economic Forum, they used virtual reality to show, uh, to do a documentary of the plight of the, um, the, the refugees, the Syrian refugees. And they had these heads of state, presidents and prime ministers, in tears because they were experiencing what the refugees experienced. Um, but virtual reality is not only about that. Virtual reality is also about um, being able to visualize big data. I'm working with this university and a large government agency to look at 100 years of financial data and then to create a, an immersive 3D space where you can actually see that data. And you can see patterns and things that you couldn't see with spreadsheets and annual reports and um, tax returns, right? So what sort of people do we need with virtual reality? Well, obviously, we need people to be able to design these virtual reality experiences. Uh, we need directors and actors. We need simulation experts, because virtual reality is going to be used to train you new skills. Um, translators. All right, augmented reality. Who's heard of augmented reality? Um, who listened to Lawrence earlier talking about Microsoft HoloLens? Right, so that's what augmented reality is, right? You put the HoloLens on, and suddenly, in your physical space, you get digital information. Augmented reality, uh, Microsoft has released the HoloLens, um, Meta about to release their glasses, uh, there's Magic Leap, which has had uh, an investment of a billion dollars by Google, right? These glasses are coming. And just like Bluetooth headsets, they will become commonplace in the working um, in, in work. And now suddenly, instead of having to take your phone out or look at your watch or look at a, a display, you'll be able to see information about anything that you're doing instantly. Imagine you are an engineer for Qantas, you're hanging off the side of a jet with one hand, and you need to see the wiring specifications of the jet. No problem. You just see them instantly. And in fact, not only do you see them, but you actually see the arrow pointing to the blue wire, right? Don't cut the blue wire. Okay. So what sort of tech, um, skills do we need there? Well, opticians, because we're actually working with the eye, right? So we're putting information in front of the eye. Um, audiologists, because augmented reality is not just about vision, it's also about hearing, it's also about uh, tactile feedback. Social psychologists, because it's going to change the very way that we interact with people. Um, ethicists, again, teachers. Okay. Um, bioinformatics, who's heard of bioinformatics? Right. So <clears throat> about five years ago, if you wanted to sequence your genome, it would have cost you about $100,000. How much do you think it costs to sequence your genome today? Just yours, right? Somebody saying 1,000, somebody saying 100, 500, five, it's not five. But it is 100. You can go to 23me.com, you can send them a little thing with a swab from your saliva, and they will sequence your genome for you, for 100 bucks, you can do it, right? It's democratized. Now imagine that in the hands of doctors in, you know, who, or, or pharmacists who are trying to come up with drugs. They can literally invent a drug for you, not have to go through thousands and, and you know, 18 months of trials with thousands of people and see what the side effects are, because they, can, they know your genome. So they know what things that you're allergic to, what things you're not allergic to. That, that world is happening right now. So what sort of um, skills do we need for bioinformatics? Um, well, we need uh, pathologists, obviously, uh, geneticists, pharmacists, biomedical engineers, and ethicists again, right? Why ethicists? Well, we don't really want to be... Has anybody seen the movie Gattaca? Okay. 
So for those of you who haven't, homework for this weekend, watch the movie Gattaca. It's an old movie, but it really explores what happens in a world where you can modify the genes of people, where you can actually literally create the baby that you want, with six fingers maybe, if you want them to be a pianist, or with, um, without the, the heart disease, or with extra muscular strength, right? That world is about three to four years away, where we'll actually have the technology to do that. Okay, robotics. This is uh, one of my favorites. Um, what do we need for, for robotics? Well, mechanical engineers, mechatronic engineers, UX and, and uh, UI designers. So UI is user interface, UX is user experience. Nobody wants a cold machine coming and telling them what to do, right? People want to interact with robots. And there's some interesting things that are happening with robots at the moment, especially in a country like Japan. So in Japan, more diapers are sold to old people than they are sold for babies, right? There are more adult diapers sold than, than baby diapers. They've got a real problem with an aging population. And guess what? Australia's heading down that path as well. We also have got an aging population. And the people, or the, the, well, not the people, those things that are going to look after our aged um, people are probably going to be robots. And so we need to be able to design a user interface and a user experience for robots that is accommodating, that uh, people have affinity to, right? Okay, um, I love this one. Who's got a drone? Hands up if you've got a drone. Yep. Uh, a couple of the parrot bebops or parrot um, little um, spiders. Um, or maybe the DJI Phantom. So what are we going to use drones for? Deliveries, yeah? What else? Sorry, shout it out if, you, if you've got an idea. Surveillance? <laughs> yeah, okay. So there's the tin, tin hat guy. Um, yeah, what else? So videography, that's a big one at the moment, right? We don't need expensive helicopters now. We can use drones. Um, ser search and rescue, right? Um, I, I actually predict that somebody's going to start a business with drones every two kilometers up the major motorways, and it'll have a, a, a defibrillator and emergency you know, first aid equipment and stuff. So if there's an accident on, on the motorway, you can literally just send the closest drone. It's only going to take a couple of minutes to get to the accident, and it'll get there before you know, the paramedics, et cetera, arrive. Um, so all sorts of things that are possible with drones... Obviously, we need people who can build them. We need people who can fly them. And when I say a swarm pilot, I literally mean a swarm pilot. There are going to be drone swarms that will do amazing things that we haven't even thought of yet. Air traffic programmers, videographers, search and rescue specialists. OK, autonomous vehicles, driverless cars. Who reckons the driverless car is coming? Yep. Who reckons they, they don't need to actually get their, their driver's license because the driverless car is coming? OK, one or two people. All right. So, so that's interesting, right? Because the first test, who knows when the first test of, for a driverless car happened in Australia or is going to happen in Australia? Okay, so I'll, I'll put you out of your misery. It was last November. Last November, South Australia, the first um, state to test driverless cars. They worked with Volvo, not Google, not Uber, Volvo. And um, they have actually passed a law that you can license a driverless car. So you don't need to get a driver's license. You can, you can literally buy a driverless car. Um, driverless cars will be here within about six years. This is where they'll start, in trucks. They'll start in trucks because you can do a, a, a truck lane on a motorway and say no other cars can go in that lane. And trucks have a real problem with speed and fatigue and maintenance and everything else. Um, but they'll very quickly go to cabs and then they'll go to cars. And by the time you are my age, your kids will be picked up for school by the driverless car service. You'll have a subscription to Ford or to Volvo or to Volkswagen, just like you have a subscription to Optus or Vodafone. And they'll pick up your kids and take them to, to school, and then they'll come pick you up and take you to work. And they know from your calendar where, you, where your meeting is, and they'll drop you off, and then they'll go and pick up somebody else. Or they know where the cheapest car park is in the city, and they'll just go to the cheapest car park in the city. That is absolutely coming. OK, 3D printing. Um, so, who's got a 3D printer? Yep, a couple of people with 3D printers. 3D printers are awesome um, because you can literally take any product and make it software. And once you can make it software, once you make it electrons, that means you can copy it perfectly, you can print it anywhere in the world. This is, this is going to disrupt retail stores, wholesalers, distribution, logistics networks. And if you think that... Um, 
that 3D printers only really print in plastic, so why would you care? They don't. They print in 170 different materials. You can print easier in titanium than you can mill titanium. You can print things that you can't manufacture any other way with 3D printers. And because of Moore's law, they're, beginning, they're going to halve in price every year, and they're going to double in power every year. And so by the time you're you know, three, four, five years out of school, 3D printers will be a commonplace thing, and your McDonald's happy toy for your, your child will be printed at home with their name on it. Right? And in fact, you might even print your burger at home. And I was working with Queensland University of Technology, and they're actually working on printing bone. So when somebody has a piece out of their skull, they literally 3D print the piece and of bone, and they put it back in. We're working in South Australia printing skin right now, today. We're printing skin so that you can do drug testing on skin um, printed rather than on people, right? So some skills that you need there. Um, this is the last one that we've got, avatars, artificial intelligence, and cognitive computing. So who's heard of artificial intelligence? Has IBM spoken today? Has anybody from IBM spoken? So they would have spoken about Watson and the amazing thing that Watson's doing. Um, this is absolutely going to change the way that we do everything. If you think Siri and Cortana and Google Now is powerful now, can you imagine when they are connected to artificial intelligence? Can you imagine when you need to go and do a parent-teacher consult because of your child at school and you won't go? Your avatar will go and have a conversation with the, with the teacher and then come and debrief you on what's happening, right? And when you're the best lecturer in the world is actually an artificial intelligence avatar and can lecture you um, and, and answer questions that you've got and can do it anywhere in the world. You don't need to go to a university campus. You can actually literally study whatever subject you need to from the best lecturer that's ever been in history and interact with them one-on-one -on -one anywhere in the world. And that world is probably about 10 years away, 10 to 15 years away. And again, we need people, we need you to have the skills, programming, data scientists, ethicists, psychologists, to be able to make that world a reality. OK, so here's another one of my favorite scientists. Um, and he said this. So Arthur C. Clarke uh, wrote Space Odyssey 2001 and that whole series. He was also a, a physicist. And he said, any sufficient advan sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And what we, need, what we need in Australia to help Australia be successful and what you need to make your life successful is a little bit of magic, the skills to become a magician. All right, so I'm at Rog42 on the interwebs. Um, if you've enjoyed this presentation, tweet, Snapchat, Instagram. If you haven't enjoyed this presentation, um, Lawrence Crumpton's inter internet Twitter handle is no. I won't, I won't. If you haven't enjoyed it, um, or if you've got any questions or criticisms, um, absolutely, look me up on the interwebs. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I speak to students all the time, and I'd love to have um, some interaction with you. All right, that's it. It's me. <laughs> Muted applause. Thank you. Are there any questions while, while I'm still up here? Yeah, go for it. Like the price difference will be between a driverless Whoa. car <laughs> okay. and a normal car. <laughs> Wow, that one caught me out of... Um, so there's a young girl over here who actually came in first, and let me answer that driverless car question. So what will the difference be in price? Oh, there's the hooter. Um, so you won't buy a car. You'll subscribe to a service. It'll be much cheaper, and you'll subscribe to a service. You won't, why would you bother owning a car when the car is driverless? It just comes and picks you up, and then you only need to, to pay for the two hours a day that you use it rather than the 24 hours a day that you own it. So, um, so it'll be much cheaper, and you, you won't end up worrying about buying one, registering one. I bought a car for my daughter yesterday. Buying, registering, insuring, all of that stuff goes away. OK, your question. I'm back. OK, um, so as I was saying, the way like, technology is being implemented into our lives so seamlessly, it's yep. pretty creepy, like the way you know, we can put it into our brains and do all these things. So. Because everything is becoming so technology oriented, so there's robots yep. and we have avatars that are coming up, how do you feel about like 
our personal human interactions will lessen so much. And I think our social skills and, you know, the way we emotionally interact with humans will yeah. lessen so much. So how do you think, how, what do you think about that? How do I, what do I think about that? And how do we avoid a world where we're all just sitting with our VR glasses on, not interacting Pretty with much. anybody, right? Yeah. Um, so, so here's the thing. Um, Socrates was uh, really critical of handwriting because he believed that y it would take away from our memory. Because as soon as you could write it down, you wouldn't have to remember something, right? So before handwriting, we had to remember the stories and the poems and everything else. Um, when the printing press came out, um, there were people in the nobility that were devastated because you know, now that um, it, it's automated and you, you lose the beautiful calligraphy that was in the Bibles and things. Um, the reality is all of these technologies are here to actually help us connect better. So, um, my, so, so what I feel is I, I think that there's a, a great amount of opportunity. The fact that um, that picture that I showed of virtual reality, the man was in uh, Queensland working on a mine. His wife was having a baby in Perth, and he could be at the birth through virtual reality. Right? So, so this technology can help you connect in ways that we've never been able to connect before. The discipline, though, is to not let it rule your life. The discipline is to use it as the tool that it is. Yep. OK, I think I've got time for one or two more questions. Yeah, shoot. Um, with the driverless cars, do you believe that artificial, artificial intelligence will be implemented? So for example, if a child ran across the street, would the car swerve off the road and kill you, or would it kill the child? Yeah, so, so that's the, the famous argument that everybody throws back. It's called the trolley car argument that everybody throws back about um, driverless cars, right? So, so the, the reality is, so very, very quickly, <clears throat> when a human is behind the wheel, they are biased to survival, and they will probably make the wrong ethical decision. Yep. When we've got the opportunity to spend months with ethicists coding in the algorithms, we're far more likely to have the right ethical decision, and we're also going to have far, far less accidents anyway. So. Um, but, but to answer your question about artificial intelligence is, yeah, eventually. So at the moment, it'll be machine learning. But more and more, it'll be artificial intelligence doing that. OK, one more question. I'm going to, to uh, yeah. um, spin Hooter. Yeah. With the question, with, with you talking about AI, do you think that Skynet is possible? Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do is you Skynet think that possible? Skynet is possible? Um, OK, so, so the question, uh, so, so I'm going to rephrase the question. Is the future going to be a utopia like Star Trek, or is it going to be a dystopia like 1984, right? Or Terminators, Skynet? I don't think it's going to be either. Um, 30 years ago, I was in high school like you are, and I was watching movies like War Games and Project X that were, you know, and uh, Red Dawn Rising and, um, and all of the post nuclear war movies, and that didn't eventuate. I think that we as a species, as humans, um, aren't going to go for utopia and we're not going to go for dystopia. I think that we're going to have life pretty much like we have now. It's just going to have more technology enablement. But that, own, that depends on people like you becoming security specialists and keeping governments in check. All right, thank you very much.